Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss an update from Rouse IS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of newspaper analysis. Today we have taken the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 8th November 2022. The articles that we are going to take up today are displayed on your screen. Let us now begin the discussion. So the inspiration for our first discussion comes from this news which featured in the Hindu newspaper on page number 1. In this Supreme Court by majority of 3 is to 2 has upheld the constitutional validity of constitution's 103rd amendment act which was done in the year 2019 and it said that this amendment which provides for 10% reservation to the economically weaker section that is EWS in admission to educational institutions and government jobs does not violate the basic structure of the constitution. Now as we can see here in GS paper 2 that is polity and governance issues and news related to the amendments and basic structures are of importance from the UPSC perspective. Now in this discussion we will look into brief historical perspective of reservation then the evolution of concept of reservation through various amendments and supreme court judgments and the recent controversy related to the 103rd constitutional amendment act. We will also discuss briefly what the bench has to say about this amendment and in last we will briefly look into the various facets relating to the reservation. So let's begin the discussion. So first let us look into the term reservation. If we go by the simple meaning, it is an arrangement where certain specified space is kept aside for individual or group. In the context of Indian polity, it is the government policy backed up by the provisions of constitutions for affirmative action or positive discrimination for reserving access to seats for certain historically disadvantageous group in the field of education, employment and politics. And here in India, the groups that are being covered through these provisions are scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, other backward caste and recently EWS. Now let us look into the historical background of the reservation policy in India. We will divide this discussion into two heads that is pre-independence and post-independence. The idea of the reservation was first propounded by Jyotirao Phule and William Hunter in the year 1882. The first concrete step towards direction of reservation was done by Rajarshi Shahu, the then Maharaja of Kolhapur princely state, when he in 1902 introduced reservation for non-Brahmin and backward classes which was soon followed by princely states of Mysore, Kochi and Travancore. You might be aware of the fact that the Parliamentary reform of 1909 and Montague Chelmsford reform of 1990 also contained the provisions related to separate electorate. Another milestone came in the year 1921 in which the Justice Party in the then state of Madras brought out legislation which was termed as communal government order and it was the first legislation on reservation by an elected body. Keep this fact in your mind as it will be the basis of the first amendment act in post-independent India. In 1932, communal award was announced by the then Prime Minister of Britain, Ramsay MacDonald. And you all are aware of subsequent event of Pune Pact between Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar. Now this can be termed as the first seed of reservation policy in independent India. Having seen the events of pre-independence India, let us look into the post-independence India and developments related to it. Now as you know, article 46 of DPSP talks about the promotion of educational and economic interests of scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and other weaker sections. 
it directs the state that state shall promote with special care the educational and economic interest of the weaker sections of the people and in particular of the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes and shall protect them from social injustice and all forms of exploitation this became the basis of this became the basis of various reservation policies by the government of india now as you can recall we talked about the communal government order by the justice party 1921 now the constitutional validity of that particular act was challenged in the champakam durai rajan case and supreme court struck down that provision by terming it violative of the basic structure of the constitution to overcome this hurdle government of india came up with the first constitutional amendment act 1951 it inserted article 15 sub clause 4 and article 16 sub clause 4 into the constitution now before moving forward we must look into the details of the article 15 and article 16 so that we can make a basic understanding for further debates now if you will look at the constitution Article 15 sub clause 1 says the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them the word only is very important as discrimination can be done on the basis of other criterias discrimination related to these mentioned criterias are prohibited sub clause 2 basically deals with any disability liability restriction or conditions with regard to access to shops wells tanks etc while sub clause 3 provides that nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any special provision for women and children now when we talked about first constitutional amendment act we saw that sub clause 4 was added to article 15 which says nothing in this article or in clause 2 of article 29 shall prevent the state from making any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizen or for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe now this term socially and educationally backward classes became the source of various judgments and debates in future course of action now sub clause 5 which was added through 93rd constitutional amendment in 2006 now as you know right to education act came to the light in the year 2005 in order to realize its aim and goal to achieve the right to education government inserted this sub clause through 93rd constitutional amendment 2006 it enabled government to make special provisions with regard to admission to educational institutions including private educational institutions now the very news that we have taken relates to this sub clause which was added through 103rd constitutional amendment act in the year 2019 and which talks about advancement of any economically weaker section of citizens other than the classes mentioned in clauses 4 and 5 that is socially and economically backward classes apart from that it added another class that is economically weaker sections Now having seen the article 15 let us look into article 16 which talks about there shall be equality of opportunity for all citizens in matters relating to employment or appointment to any office under the state now you can realize that article 15 is much broader than article 16 where article 16 simply talks about the employment related to any office under the state article 15 encompasses a larger meaning to it so what does article 16 says article 16 sub clause 2 says no citizen shall on grounds only of religion race caste sex descent place of birth residence or any of them be ineligible for discriminated against in respect of 
any employment or office under the state. Now, as you know, first Constitutional Amendment Act also inserted 16 sub clause 4 in the Constitution, and this sub clause talks about that nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any provision for the reservation of appointments or post in favor of any backward classes of citizens which in the opinion of the state is not adequately represented in the services under the state. Now as you know 103rd constitutional amendment also added sub clause 6 in the constitution it talks about Nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any provisions for the reservation of appointment or posts in favor of any economically weaker section. Now, after having a look at the article 15 and article 16 and understanding the difference between them, let us look into another aspect. Initially, the Constitutional Assembly provided for reservation for SC and ST only and that too for a period of 10 year. But later on another section that is other backward caste was also included in the purview of reservation. The first committee to identify the OBCs in India was under the chairmanship of Kaka Kelelkar in 1953. However, the suggestions and recommendations of this committee never saw light of the day. Then again in 1979, a committee was constituted under the chairmanship of B.P. Mandal in 1979. It submitted its report in the year 1980. However, the concrete action through a government order was taken by the V.P. Singh government in 1990 and was repeated again by the Narsimha Rao government in 1991. Now this provision of providing 27% reservation to OBC was challenged in the court and in the famous Indra Sahani judgment in 1992 court opined the following. It upheld the constitutional validity of 27% reservation for OBCs. However, court struck down the provision for 10% reservation for economic weaker section among upper classes by terming it violative of basic structure. Along with it, court also brought in cap of 50% in the reservation. That means reservation cannot exceed 50% criteria and for this, Court cited Article 335 which talks about the efficiency in the administration. Along with it, court also opined about the exclusion of creamy layer from the reservation criteria. Now you already know the 93rd constitutional amendment and the articles that it has inserted into the constitution. Now as we know, 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act which came in the year 2019 provided for 10% reservation to the economically weaker sections in admission to the educational institutions and government jobs. Now in order to avail such benefits, government also provided some basic criteria which were based on annual income, possession of land and house. Now this constitutional amendment was challenged by certain NGOs like Janhit Abhiyan and Youth for Equality. The basis of their challenge was related, mainly related to the Indra Sahani judgment. The petitioner claimed that as propounded in Indra Sahani judgment, the quota cannot be given purely on economic basis. The petitioners also, the petitioners also claimed that the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act is breaching the basic structure of constitution as it excludes the socially and educationally backward classes, OBCs, SCs, STs from the scope of EWS reservation. Again, the amendment breached the 50% quota limit as was set in the Indra Sahani judgment. Now, as you know, Supreme Court by the majority of 3 is to 2 has upheld the constitutional validity of the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act and has held that this amendment which provides for 10% reservation to EWS does not violate the basic structure of the constitution. The majority judgment says 
that reservation is an instrument of affirmative action by the state to ensure an all inclusive march towards the goal of an egalitarian society while countering inequality and in doing so it does not violate basic structure as providing reservation on economic ground does not cause any damage to the basic structure of the constitution the bench further said that treating the ews class of citizen as a separate class would be a reasonable classification and cannot be called unreasonable or unjustifiable classification or violative of article 14 further the court says the special rights of sc st and obc will not be affected as amendment created a separate class of ews from the general or unreserved category without affecting the rights of the already reserved category now the dissenting judges have opined that this is more of an exclusion as the scheduled caste obcs and scheduled tribes have been kept out from the purview of ews reservation so it is more of a discrimination and compartmentalization to now having seen the basic information related to reservation and 103rd constitutional amendment act and the recent judgment let us briefly look into why reservation is required now the legal basis for providing reservation is to involve them in the process of legislation now the socio political aim of providing reservation is to eliminate the discrimination faced by the members of deprived society now it also aims to provide a level playing field along with the aim of advancement of the backward classes now there are some debate around reservation so those who are in the favor of removing reservation argue that it is irrelevant to the modern times now reservation has also created unnecessary division and tension in the society now the aim of inclusiveness has also not been achieved yet only a few section of these reserved category have been able to corner the maximum benefit while others are still deprived now this concept of reservation is against the concept of meritocracy last but not the least the reservation has become a political tool to achieve narrow political objective by various political parties and personalities so what is the way forward now this judgment has opened the topic of reservation to wider interpretation as the bench itself said that it is to be noted and watched how states are going to use this judgment so the need of the r is to formulate an objective criteria so that real beneficiaries can be identified we should also periodically recalibrate the financial criteria to avail the reservation under the ews category the next discussion is based upon this article which featured on the page number 7 of the hindu newspaper as we know global and regional food security have been deliberated upon as one of the priority agendas of the g20 for many years now the situation has worsened with growing conflicts and a spiraling climate crisis marked by droughts floods cyclones and economic downturns in the past few years This article connects India's G20 presidency and the issue of global food security. Now as we know food security means availability, accessibility and affordability of food to all people always. That means availability at all the time. The poor households are more vulnerable to food insecurity whenever there is a problem of production or distribution of food crops. food security depends on the public distribution system and government vigilance and action at times when this security is threatened india achieved self sufficiency in food grains in the year 1970s since the mid 1990s it has consistently been able to ensure that there is enough food in terms of calories available to feed its entire population It is the world's largest producer of milk pulses and millets and the second largest producer of rice wheat sugarcane groundnuts vegetables fruits and cotton 
annual grain production has also remained relatively stable with a decline in production between 2014 and 2016 caused by droughts now if we will look into this news as per the requirement of upsc exam the syllabus of paper 2 and 3 can be related to this issue as in paper 2 it gets covered under issues related to vulnerable sections whereas in gs paper 3 the issue of food security has been directly mentioned so here in this discussion we will take up various aspects related to food security like we will cover in what ways can food security manifest we will also see challenges pertaining to food security in india and we will look into government initiatives so let's begin the discussion so first we will look into in what ways can food insecurity manifest and we can see here we can broadly distribute this discussion under three subheadings availability accessibility and affordability so as the term suggests availability means food production within the country food imports and the previous year stock stored in government granaries while accessibility means food is within reach of every person while affordability means that an individual has enough money to buy sufficient safe and nutritious food to meet one's dietary needs now having discussed that in what ways can food insecurity manifest let us look into who is food insecure so first category is the landless people with little or no land to depend upon second is the traditional artisans providers of traditional services etc third is the self employed workers and destitutes including the beggars now in the urban areas families whose working member are generally employed in ill paid occupation and casual labor market that is the urban poors apart from this a large proportion of pregnant and nursing mothers and children especially under the age of 5 years constitute an important segment of food insecurity apart from these broader categories we can also find the social composition along with the inability to buy food also plays a role in food insecurities the scs sts and some sections of the obcs who have either poor land base or very low land productivity are prone to food security apart from this the people affected by natural disasters are also prone to the food insecurity apart from these sections the food insecure people are disproportionately large in some regions of the country such as economically backward states with high incidences of poverty tribal and remote areas along with regions which are more prone to natural disasters etc having identified the manifestation and the section which are food insecure let us look into the challenges to food security in india now if we now if we look into the challenges to food security in india the first and foremost important thing is lack of dietary diversity India has been successful in ensuring that its population has access to food. However, it has failed to ensure that it includes the necessary diversity in types of food available. Second is micronutrient deficiency. Micronutrient deficiencies are common in India mainly because of focus on calorie availability and not dietary diversity. Now the third challenge is related to the poor storage. It is estimated that about 62000 tons of stored grain mainly rice and wheat were damaged between 2011 and 2017 due to pest infestation and exposure to rain. Water mismanagement is another challenge to food security in India. poor water management and subsidies that encourage wasteful practices in agriculture production could come to present a threat to indian food security 
Together, the lowest performing states on the Composite Water Management Index of the Niti Aayog are home to about half of the Indian population and are the country's bread baskets. Now you can imagine wasteful practices here will definitely pose a challenge to food security in India. Now low agricultural productivity is another challenge to food security in India. Attention was drawn to this yield gap in the Indian Ministry of Finance 2015 and 2016 economic survey. Disproportionate subsidies are another challenge to food security in India. They disproportionately benefit owners of large land holdings, also adversely impacting the environment. According to the Indian National Sample Survey Office, most Indian farmers possess less than one hectare of land, which is not enough to achieve food security through subsistence farming. Now, declining relative income, low produce of a small and marginal farmer, which does not last year long, and the absence of a universal public distribution system results into high level of hunger. Apart from these, ecological crisis can cause irreversible damage to natural resources and a loss in productivity if left unchecked. Apart from these major apart from these major challenges there are other issues like rapidly growing population, resource constraints, agrarian distress and continued agitation by farmers accompanied by the impacts of covid-19 pandemic are contributing towards challenges related to food security in india now having seen the challenges we must look into the government initiative to contain or to mitigate the challenges related to food security in india now government has taken various measures to address this issue of food security like in the field of food and nutrition security schemes like national cooked mid day meal program ICDS that is integrated child development scheme kishori shakti yojana nutrition program for adolescent girls and pradhan mantri gramodaya yojana now you must be knowing basic details regarding these schemes as mid day meal program is the world's largest school feeding program reaching out to about 12 crore children across the country The program aims at enhancing enrollment, retention and attendance and simultaneously improving nutritional levels among children. Similarly, National Food Security Act 2013 with the objective to provide for food and nutritional security in human life cycle approach by ensuring access to adequate quantity of of quality food at affordable prices to people to live a life with dignity the act also has a special focus on the nutritional support to women and children now mg narega provides a legal guarantee for 100 days of employment to enhance livelihood security public distribution system plays an important role in the provision of food security The PDS in India is perhaps the largest distribution network of its kind in the world. And lastly, the Antodaya Anna Yojana. It contemplates identification of 1 crore poorest of the poor families from amongst the BPL families that is below poverty line families covered under TPDS within the states and providing them food grains at a highly subsidized rate. The next topic of discussion for today is based on this article which featured on the Hindu newspapers page number 6 This article talks about the significance of empowering frontline health workers who are driving mother and child nutrition and development outcomes at the last mile Now if you will analyze the UPSC GS syllabus this topic relates to the social issues as mentioned in GS paper 1 Now as per the writer first 1000 days of child are crucial to ensure better health results throughout his life now what is first 1000 days it is roughly around 36 month starting from the conception to the first 2 years of child life now why 1000 days 
according to the author period of rapid physical growth and accelerated mental development about 80% of brain development takes place in the first 1000 days of life and that is why this period is crucial for child development and why the talk of frontline worker as the responsibility to ensure good initial health lies with asha workers anganwadi workers and auxiliary nurse midwives that is anm so let's begin the discussion now icds that is integrated child development scheme or anganwadi scheme is important for mains as well as prelims purpose so this initiative was started in the year 1975 and why was it started providing for supplementary nutrition immunization and preschool education to the children and it is world's largest such program it is a centrally sponsored scheme and it covers all district which includes children from 0 to 6 years of age pregnant mother and lactating mothers the main objective of this scheme is to improve the nutritional and health outcomes psychological physical and social development of the child and the mother reduce the incidence of mortality morbidity malnutrition and school dropout and enhance the capability of the mother to look after the normal health and nutritional need of the child through proper nutrition and health education as it is a centrally sponsored scheme funding ratio is 90s to 10 for northeastern state while for the other state it is 60 is to 40 now another important information is mg narega is used for construction of anganwadi building one anganwadi center for a population of 400 to 800 and 40 children and this criteria is less in tribal and hilly areas now this article also talk about the poshan abhiyan now this article also talks about a new initiative under poshan abhiyan now this initiative has been termed as common application software it has connected various levels to the internet and thus making a comprehensive web based dashboard it functions through a mobile application at the level of anganwadi worker supervisor at the sector level and a comprehensive web based dashboard at block district state and national level it enables a real time information about service delivery now this application is aimed at now this application is aimed to augment system strengthening in anganwadi service delivery and looks at improving the nutrition outcomes through effective monitoring and timely intervention the software allows the capture of data from the field on electronic devices that is mobile or tablets now as the article talks about anm asha and anganwadi workers let us look at a comparative analysis about the same now the nature and amount of payment can vary from place to place and time to time rest other things remain more or less same now for all three services females are the preferred gender in terms of residence with respect to the area of work anm has usually from outside the village they serve while asha worker must be from the village they serve while anganwadi worker should be preferably from the village they serve the requirement for level of education for anm at least 10 years for asha at least 8 years and for anganwadi workers at least 5 years while talking about their selection anms are health department employee so their selection is done by the health department while asha workers are community volunteer so their selection is done by gram sabha and health department officials anganwadi workers are also community based workers and are selected through block icds committee training period also differs it is 18 months for anm 24 days for asha worker and 3 months for anganwadi workers the population coverage is 3000 to 5000 for anm 700 to 1000 for asha and 700 to 1000 for anganwadi worker 
Now having seen the difference, let us look into various kind of services, the target groups and who is the service provider. Now for the supplementary nutrition, target group is children below 6 years, pregnant and lactating mothers. Service providers are Anganwadi worker and Anganwadi helpers. And it is done through Ministry of Women and Child Development that is MWCD. For services related to immunization, target group is same, the children below 6 years, the pregnant and lactating mothers. And service providers are ANM, medical officer and it is done through Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Health checkups, again, target group is same. Service can be provided through ANM, medical officers or Anganwadi worker. And again, Ministry of Health and Health System is the service provider. For referral services, the target group remains the same. Service provider can be Anganwadi worker, ANM or medical officer. For preschool education, target group is children between 3 to 6 years and this should be provided through Anganwadi workers and this service is provided by Ministry of Women and Child Development. For nutrition and health education, the target group is women of the age 14 to 45 years and the service providers are Anganwadi, ANM and medical officers. Here, Ministry of Health along with Ministry of Women and Child Development are the service providers. Now, as you have seen that Anganwadi workers have been interested with the providing preschool education in the age group of 3 to 6 years. This article highlights the issues related to Anganwadi scheme and suggested some way out. The first issue is aspiration of parents are different from the service provided by the Anganwadi workers. While parents want modern education and technical skill and want to move away from rote learning, Anganwadi workers are not equipped with such skills. Second is issue of language that is one size fits all. All the charts and documents and books are available in basically two languages, Hindi and English. So it is not serving entire population at the grassroot level. Anganwadi workers have a challenging task in achieving maths proficiency. They have a poor performance in delivering the same to the children. Another challenge lies in the stiff competition from private preschools, which are better aligned with the aspirations of the parents. Now the next issue is educators are less skilled. Now as you have seen due to lack of modern skills, Anganwadi workers have been failing to meet the aspiration of parents. And another issue is lack of child specific plan. Article suggests some way out from these challenges. First is changing schedule as per children's level of development. While it suggests curriculum based on the cognitive skill of child. It also suggests regular Shiksha Chopal that is parent teachers meet. It suggests beginning of inculcating English language and math to the Anganwadi workers. So the skill upgradation is also required. It also talks about extensive use of audiovisual. So in other words, we can say it talks about the use of modern tools in the education.